the love which are communion elements in hand. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son whom you sent to die on the cross for us. We know that he keeps calling and calling and calling. And we pray, Father, that may we be able to identify his voice and answer to the calling. May we not go back, may we not hold back, but may we come forth and walk with him closely like never before. We pray, Father, that as we partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, our minds will be open to his call. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We love, let's break the bread and partake. And let's partake of the wine. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Are we ready for the word of God? Yes. I want to hear those who are ready. Yes. One I'm ready. ready for the word of God we are ready. Morning. Ready. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes, I want to hear you. I want to hear you on mute and talk back to me is if necessary. It's also encouraging to know that you are there. Amen. 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 Beloved, Amen. on this 27th day of October 2024, <laughs> we are going to talk on the principle of living by the proceeding word. The principle of living by the proceeding word. Amen. The principle of living by the proceeding word. We'll start off by take, defining a few of these words in context, then look at why we should study about this principle. And just conclude by talking about a few practical approaches to bring this principle home. Amen. It doesn't make sense for us to study and leave everything hanging in the air. So for our working definitions, we'll define principle as a fundamental truth that serves as foundation for the belief system known as Christianity. That's our working definition of principle, foundational truth that serves as foundation or a fundamental truth that serves as foundation for the belief system known as Christianity. And the word living is the pursuit of a specified lifestyle, which in this case is a Christian lifestyle. The pursuit of a Christian lifestyle, that's the living we're talking about. And another word we see there is proceeding, proceeding word will be a word that has its origin from God. The proceeding word, a word that has its origin from God. So the principle that requires that your walk with Christ be guided by what you should do and not what you can do. You need to hear that again. What you should do and not what you can do. That principle is the working definition for us for the principle of living by the proceeding word. A principle that helps us to be guided by what we should do and not by what we can do. So the question becomes, why should we study about the principle of living by the proceeding word out of the mouth of God? Why is that important? Let's go back to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, it's kind of a long read, so please bear with me. It says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruits from any of the trees in the garden? 
I'm using the New Living Translation uh, version. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. That is what the word of God says, amen. Beloved, Satan knew that Adam was the highest form of God's creation. That said that Adam was new upon the face of the earth, both Adam and Eve, and had not yet understood that they came with the potential of the fullness of Elohim. Satan saw that the glory that he wanted had been given to man. So he proposed to take it from man before man would realize who he truly was. Beloved, when issues concerning your identity are tested, you should remember that you are Elohim. You are Elohim. You are who God says you are and nothing else. Man is the only being of such high spiritual rank to whom God had given the free will to operate upon both the earth and spirit realms. Scriptures say that Satan walked with the shrewdest of all the wild animals. It was intelligent, clever, alert. The serpent was cunning, calculating, and showing sharp powers of judgment. This is the personality that Satan used to approach the woman. Notice how he framed the question. Did God say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Tell me, my beautiful friend, Eve, can you really think of this our good God creating a succulent fruit just to let it ripen and fall to the ground? Would you think that? Can you say God is that wasteful? You know, the first part of Eve's response was enough. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. She had expressed her understanding that her decision must be guided by what she should do. In this case, she should not eat that fruit. She should have stopped right there, but no, she kept talking. Most of the times we don't know when to stop talking, especially when no one read your Miranda rights to you. In this case, no one read those rights to, 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 to Eve. She didn't know that she had a right to remain silent and that anything that she said could be used against her in the court of heaven. She didn't know that she had the right to talk to Adam before answering any questions and to have Adam present at the time or during her questioning. So she gave Satan more information than necessary by saying, if we do, we will die. By saying, if we do, going that far to explain to Satan suggests that 
if the consequence of dying was removed from the equation, she might just consider. If we do, we will die. If we will not die, maybe we will do. The ability to pursue her desire was restricted by this condition, which if she could bypass, she would indulge. That's an undertone of if we do, we will die. I like to live. I don't like to die. I don't want to die. So because of that fear, I will not do it. She was exposing something in herself, which is one of the reasons why we are studying the principle of living by the proceeding word. When Satan hears that, hears a thing like that, this is where he grabs his remote control and starts pairing it with his potential victim. It could happen to you that you expose an undertone, a, an internal feeling to Satan, and he will grab his remote control. What I want us to recognize is that Satan's remote control has not yet been produced here on the earth. It is futuristic because it has the ability to reconfigure itself to suit all the existing tech companies. If it is Sony, it will pick up Sony. If it is Samsung, it will pick that up. Whatever it is, it will pick it up. doesn't matter whether you are on Android or an iPhone. Satan's remote control can switch around until it picks up signals from your end. And what does he do after he has gotten a signal? He goes ahead now to search for a compelling antidote that will knock you off your reasoning matrices and cause you to act in a way that you wouldn't have if you had just stuck with the simple desire. But as you push the desire forward and it is tottering on the borders of lust, all Satan is left with now is to try to lure you into doing what you should not do. Satan is looking at his potential victim for a sign of lust. What will really be the breaking point for her? He does not walk away, but he will persist. He will keep trying at all test points. Satan's remote control will move to enticements at the points of loss of your flesh. It will switch from there to loss of the eyes. It will switch from there to the pride of life. You keep on doing that until the loss in the victim becomes strong enough to respond to the signals of his remote control. Then Satan connects to that channel with a very strong impression, like someone speaking with a megaphone. He spoke to Eve. You won't die. Giving her all the assurance in his voice. You won't die. Trying to take sides with Eve to make Eve feel like Satan is the better person here. He does that to us all the time, beloved, which is why we must study the principle of living by the proceeding word out of the mouth of God. Satan will side with you as he sided with Eve and says, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. You feel like I must immediately buy this stuff. I must immediately get this thing for myself. I must immediately taste of it. That self-gratification takes over and blinds every iota of reasoning in you. You start weighing your options. Did I hear Satan well? 
as a victim, you start drifting from what you should do to what you can do. I think I like what I'm hearing. That's the nature that we have, the nature of one who is not vested in the word, the nature of one who does not live by the proceeding word of God. You fall for tricks like this. I think I like what I'm hearing. You start winning what Satan has just told you. Eve did not realize that she was already like God, for God made her in his image. Eve did not realize that she did not need to do anything to prove to anyone that she was already like God. She displayed a lack of knowledge. She displayed an emptiness that we become when we are not going on dates with God. There was no written word at the time, but God visited them often to show his love and give them the opportunity to know him more. The woman was convinced by what Satan had told her. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open to the realm of the world, not the realm of the earth that God had placed them in. Their eyes were open to the realm of being apart from God, not the realm of the garden of Eden, not the realm of the presence of God. Now they had chosen a lifestyle to live apart from God. Then they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves because they had lost the cover of the presence, the cover that was in the garden. They had stepped outside the hedge. Beloved, it is only the word of God that keeps you in the hedge. It is the word of God that keeps you in the garden. And this is how temptation was introduced into the earth. This is how the fall of man came about. This is how man exchanged his glory and dominion with Satan and how Satan became Lord over the earth. This is what gave Satan the right to tell Jesus that the kingdoms of this world belong to me and that he would give them to, to, to Jesus if, if Jesus would only bow down and worship him. It is by the same strength that Satan, knowing that Eve and Adam ate what he had proposed to them, that he approached Jesus in the wilderness at the time when Jesus, being a human, had fasted for 40 days and was hungry. He was hungry. When we, when we come home from work, after working the whole day, say, for instance, you did not even have lunch while at work, you are hungry. As soon as you enter the house and the, the, the aroma of the food hits your nose, you, 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 you just want to eat. Satan knew that that was the right moment to approach Christ after he had fasted for 40 days. Satan will tempt you when you are in your most vulnerable position because he is very strategic and focused on getting results. In Matthew 4, 1 to 4, the word of God tells us, so then Jesus was led up into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. And he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones be turned into bread. But he answered, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
It is a word that proceeds out of the mouth of God that assures you that you are a son of God, that you are a child of God. And you don't need any Satan to contest that. You don't need to prove anything to Satan for him to know that you are a son of God because the proceeding word out of the mouth of God has already declared to you that you are his son. Christ knew that. Christ had the desire to eat, but did not let his desire to become a lust. After 40 days of fasting, he could still resist the devil. What helped Christ is the fact that he was the word. He knew the word. Christ could not perish because he had knowledge of the word. Christ knew that man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible tells us that we live because Christ lives. And as wise people, we must walk in the footsteps of Christ to get ahead in every aspect of life. We must study and embrace the principle of living by the preceding word because it is one of the principles that Christ applied to defeat Satan. Amen. The principle of living by the preceding word is imperative that we become familiar with. It is a principle that places a lot of demand on a deep friendship with God. You want to know what God is saying. You want to know what God has said. You want to walk with God in a way that will not be offensive to him. You want to know God as your friend. Yes, you have known him as a father. You have known him as a judge, and you need to know him as a friend. You want to demonstrate that you love God for who he is. You want to demonstrate that it is because of the love that you want to get close to him. Otherwise, you will not be in friendship. You are not in friendship with someone you don't love. You do not need to be in the presence of your friend, the one whom you love, before you demonstrate that you love them. You don't have to be in their presence before you do what they like. Friendship is not based on eye service. Any such friendship based on eye, eye service, any such friendship based on doing what is right by your friend, only when your friend is there, is not true friendship. Such friendship is shallow. Such friendship is premised on falsehood. A true friend is someone that you will always want to be on your side. So no matter whether he or she is there with you, it will not change the things that you do. You will not cheat on a friend because he has traveled and will be gone for a month or two. That's not true friendship. You will not gossip about a friend because she stepped out to use the restroom. It's like you were just waiting for this opportunity for her to step aside. Then you will say something about her which you won't say in her presence. And that's not friendship. You will not betray a friend's trust by talking about what she told you in private. If you will not do these things because you are in friendship with a human being, how much more should you not do the things that God has said you shouldn't do? What you should do and what you should not do are all part of the proceeding words from God. How will you know the proceeding word if you do not study the word? Studying the word is what builds the sound foundation of your friendship with God. Studying the word gives you the opportunity to collect data concerning the Lord so that you can make informed decision to be his friend or not to. Every time that you pick up your Bible to study, you invite the Lord on a date with you. I said, every time you pick up your Bible to study, you invite the Lord 
to go on a date with you. Oh, glorious God, would you like to meet and talk? He always shows up every time that you ask him out on a date. He is longing to go on many dates with you. He wants to talk with you. He desires that you become a storehouse of words that proceed from him. He wants you to know how much he loves you. He wants you to know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord does not want you to be ignorant of the power and authority that he has bestowed on you. He does not want you to leave the glory that he has packaged for you on the table for Satan to walk away with. So he is talking to you right now to let you know that he's looking forward to your next date. The next time that you will set aside to be with him. God is looking forward to that time when you too will sit so he can seal in you words that proceed from his mouth. Are you going to take up that date with him? Are you going to go out with the Lord and spend that time with him? Beloved, most people often start off in their walk with God very well. Then complacency sets in. The story of David was very much like that. He knew what he should do before he reigned as king. The corruption of power that took hold of David when he became, a, 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 became king and he became a victim of what he can do. But before then, David knew exactly what he should do. Power led him to demonstrate what he can do as if he needed to prove to anybody. And finally, David repented and walked with God, prioritizing what he should do over what he could do for the rest of his life. His story gives us hope of walking in friendship with God. And I would encourage you to study this man, David, this man whom God calls a man after his own heart. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 3 to 8, records a classic example of a choice made by one whose desire to have God as a friend led him to be called a man after God's own heart. David did not mince it. So 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 3 to 4. Let's see how what you should do contests with what you can do. The word of God says, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Now your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Amen. Beloved, David understood that it is about what you should do 
and not what you can do. The principle of living by the proceeding word trains us to understand that it is about what you should do, not what you can do. Because there is nothing you cannot do. There is nothing you cannot do. Don't let the devil ask you that question. If you are the son of God. Because as the son of God, made in the image of God, you have the ability to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So it is never about what you can do, beloved. Okay. May this be embraced, may this sink in us that we are studying this principle because it is about what you should do when the devil tells you to do a thing or two. David was faced with a tough decision because here he was with the men whose lives had become miserable for a very long time because they were moving about with David as he ran away from Saul. David was with men who would fight with Saul's army to stop them from getting at David. David's men could not settle with their wives and children because Saul of Saul's pursuit of David had caused them to resort to a vagabond lifestyle just to stay safe and save David's life in the process. It was militarily unwise to establish a permanent camp because word would get to Saul and he would raid them in hopes of killing David. All of David's loyalists were putting pressure on him to act and end their mis misery. They wanted David to kill Saul and get a steady life. It made sense to kill Saul since Saul was bent on killing David. But David knew what he should do, beloved. And this is what the principle of living by the proceeding word is all about. You have to know what you should, you should do. At no point did David doubt what he could do, especially right there in the cave where Saul was there with just David and David's men, they could have pounced on him and killed him. But top on David's mind was what he should do. Responding to the pressure, he reluctantly cut off the hem of Saul's garment. David did a thing that Saul didn't even notice. He did a thing that did not make Saul any less of a king. But it bothered David that he had cut Saul's robe. It bothered David that he had acted to prove what he could do. It bothered David because by so doing, he was taking vengeance into his own hands. It bothered David because his act had placed him in the uncomfortable position of playing God to Saul. When you, when you take vengeance upon yourself, you are playing God. David lamented cutting the king's robe because he knew he shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed. Beloved, as I said before, as a righteous person, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens. But should you do what's in front of you right now? If David did not spend time to know the laws of the Lord, he wouldn't have known to not do harm to the anointed of the Lord. It was not necessary to turn stone into bread to prove a point to Satan. But when it was necessary to feed multitudes, Christ demonstrated that the warehouse of heaven was open to him. As Elohim, 
that God created us to be. There is a food, a type of food that we eat that the world does not know. Just like Christ confessed to his apostles in John chapter 4, verses 31 to 34. The New King James Version renders it like this. Say, but he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What is your food, beloved? What is your food? Do you know the work God sent you to do? And are you doing that work? God keeps track of the decent folks, beloved. What they do won't soon be forgotten. In hard times, they will hold their heads high. When the shelves are bare, they will be full. The loyal, the reliable, the hardworking, the faithful, the committed, walk in step of God. Their paths are blazed by God, and they are happy. If they stumble, they are not down for long, because God has a grip on their hands, and he never turns away from his friends. The God we serve never turns away from his friends. In Psalms 37 verse 25, we see King David's observation in the following words. Say, I have been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen a righteous person abandoned or his descendants begging for food. We see in Matthew 4, 1 to 4, like we read earlier. Say, Jesus was led up into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be turned into bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Beloved, do you, do you, have the residual authority and power that comes with the office that you have been given? Do you know your work that God has given you? Satan was tempting Jesus to act apart from his father. He was tempting Jesus to act, to act away from God. And that's why the emphasis was about can it be done as opposed to should it be done. Every time Satan comes before you, he's trying to make you question, can it be done? But I've come to remind you that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The question becomes, can you be in power? Can you be in authority? Can you have all of this and still not use that power to do, to prove a point? Can you be like that and still remember that it is about what I should do, not what I can do? If you are in true power, if you are in true authority, you realize that you can do all things. And what is difficult for you would be, should I do it just because I have, the, I have the power? Will you let your ego motivate you to prove your authority? We need to remind ourselves, beloved, that it has to be about the proceeding word of God. Man was designed to act only by the proceeding word of God. As you wake up each day, as you brace yourself to face any challenge, as you make your step into that boardroom or office or factory, or you're taking a call, wherever you go, 
And as you engage in any activity, you must remind yourself that you will do nothing away. You will do nothing apart from God. It is the best decision to make. I will not do it without knowing what the word of God says about it. I will not do it if it goes contrary to the word of God. I will not do it if it means that I will be acting in disobedience to God. You were not made to act apart from God, but to act in unison with God. You were made to be an earthen vessel through whom God will carry out his unique manifestation of himself upon the earth. Beloved, are you able to say that your decisions and actions are a rendering of God's unique manifestation through you? Would you say that you heard God very well before you made the decision to make the move that you just made? Your last move, can you say that it was what you heard God say? The decision you took 5, 10, or 15 years ago when you had not received Christ could be left out of this consideration. But what about what has happened after that period? What about now that you call him your savior? What about now that he has become your Lord? Think about these things, beloved. What was Christ's rank or influence in the matrix that guided your decision to accept the job that you are doing? What led you to get married to your spouse? Why did you move to this city or to that city? What caused you to buy all the colors of the same bag or all the colors of the same shoes or all the colors of the same dress? Is it you making the decisions or is that what God is telling you? Did you make those decisions to measure up to your neighbors? Is your life driven by a desire to be like the Joneses? Is that the proceeding word of God for you? Beloved, we have unfortunately and voluntarily gravitated towards a world of doing everything based on what we see that others have done or are doing, but not necessarily based on what the Spirit is saying to us. Capitalism or the Babylonian economic system has influenced our lives such that we unconsciously act in response to what we see the Joneses doing, but not what the Spirit is saying to us. Impulse buying is at an all-time high among brethren because most of it is influenced by what we see owned by other Christians. We act apart from God when we see something with a beloved and conclude that it is good for all members of the body. You buy just because brother B or sister S has it. You may be acting apart from God. You go to the event just because family F has gone there. You may be acting apart from God. Even when it may seem like the right thing to do, even when it may seem like the right place to be, Living life of a copycat, living the life of competition is not what God designed for you. The adjectives economical, prudent, unwasteful, cautious, self-discipline, and the like would be associated with our spending habits when we live by the proceeding word of God. Is that what can be said about your spending habits? Beloved, I've come to remind someone that you are not in a competition. Competition is not the character of our creator. Competition is not the proceeding word of God for your life. This I will repeat a thousand times because it is that important for you to know. Competition is not the proceeding word of God for you and your family. Competition is not what God is asking that you and your family should engage in at a time such as this. And at no time will he make 
it's your portion. Competition is never the portion of a child of God. God is not in the business of suppressing the originality that he has configured in you so that you should metamorphose into your neighbor under the guise of competition. Who is the God in you in competition with? Have you sat back to ask yourself that question? Who can compete with God? Engaging in competition is a demonstration of loss of identity. You want to prove a thing to who? Beloved, you have lost it when you feel and think that you should look like or be like someone else. You have lost it. You have lost it when all that's in your head is to dress like, talk like, walk like, or live like someone else. You have lost it because you have dropped the originality of God in you and are pursuing shadows in your neighborhood or social network. You have lost it because you have stopped being the vessel to portray the image of God here on earth and you are pursuing a uniqueness that is not yours to show the world. Everyone comes with a uniqueness of God to manifest in this world. And veering, of course, is not your portion. Why would you desire the uniqueness of your friend to the extent that it becomes a lust? Why would you let Satan entice you with a bewitchment to function way below capacity because the loss of the eyes has misled you to think that it's greener on that side? You are focusing on copying the physical manifestation of someone's DNA while letting what you are meant to do to gather dust or rust on a shelf. That person's DNA will never become your DNA, no matter how hard you try. We must study the proceeding word of God to know who you are and live just like that. You like to look like Beyonce, so what? You are not Beyonce. You like to look like Jay-Z, so what? You are not Jay-Z. You know what you look like when you get such a compliment? The person is just telling you that you look like you are living apart from God. The person is telling you you have become a victim of the devil's enticement. You are not living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You are chasing the passing world. You are chasing shadows. You are chasing that which is temporary. You are giving up the superior for an inferior. When you live a life as directed by the voice of God in your spirit, you are living out the display of the innate superior who resides in you. That's your most organic way to live. That's your most natural way to live. Abandoning that for the display of the same superior being residing in your neighbor is inferior to you in that your action suggests that you know more than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who now dwell in you. You are living in disobedience. Your neighbor's streets, as awesome as they may be, are as good and as necessary to display the versatility of God as yours. You have it in you. Display it. Let God manifest the uniqueness that he has ordained to manifest through you. Don't drop that in preference to the uniqueness that he has ordained to manifest through another person. The devil robs you of your identity when you become one of those who wants to dress like or talk like your pastor or apostle or bishop or whatever title your church leader goes by. Your identity becomes that of the cult around the leader of your church, whereas it should be about the cult around Jesus Christ. Slowly but surely, you engage a slippery slope of idolizing the leader of your church you end up destroying yourself and most often equally destroying a leader in the process. All of this 
because you forego the uniqueness of God that he wants to demonstrate through you in preference to the uniqueness that he is revealing through someone else. Beloved, the system of the world that we live in has deceived us throughout our lives that living like the Joneses is the way to go. But living like the Joneses, for the most part, is living apart from God. It is living by what you see, not what you know. How can you know when you have not heard from your trusted source, the Holy Spirit, whose mission is to remind you about all things? The Holy Spirit will remind you about the now word of God concerning your life. The word that is in season for you. That's the word that will carry you along the permanent path. That's the word that's tangible because it is spirit and it is life. Christ said that the proceeding words out of his mouth are spirit and they are life. We must live by the proceeding words out of the mouth of God. These are the let there be words and there was. Let there be lights and there was light. Get up and eat. The Lord said to Elijah, Elijah, say, get up and eat some more. For the journey you are going to is a long journey. He ate. Because he ate in obedience to that word. The food he had eaten was able to sustain him for 40 days in a row. Beating every form of computer simulations or scientific explanations. These are words that leave you in no doubt that man does not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We must live by the proceeding words out of the mouth of God. These are the words that do not fall to the ground. Words that you must live by when you are faced between a rock and a hard place. Words that testify that our Father never leaves us nor forsakes us. Words that demonstrate that it is never too late for our Father to show up. God said to Moses, why cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites. Order them to get moving. Hold your staff high and stretch your hand out over the sea. Split the sea. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And, and God, with a terrific east wind, all night made the sea go back. He made the sea dry ground. The sea water split. The Israelites walk through the sea on dry ground with the waters on, on, uh, forming a wall to their left and to their right, living by the proceeding word out of the mouth of God. It reminds us of the authority that God has given us over the land, the air, and the water. They are the words that create the right atmosphere. When a great storm arose and the waves splashed into the boat so that it was Peeling the boat, Christ was in the stand asleep on a pillow. Then his disciples woke him up and he arose and released a proceeding word. He said, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. The proceeding words out of the mouth of God. They are the words that create the proper alignment in the universe and cause your destiny helpers to locate you. These are the words that do not return void, but will accomplish the intent for which they were released. I have seen how delays have meant the piling up and accumulation of returns of the investments of the faithful. I know by experiential knowledge that the proceeding words out of the mouth of God provide more than enough food for the starved and the hungry. Words that rain manna and quail in the desert Words that turn water into the best wine. Words that cause what you have in your hand to multiply over and over until you have enough to pay your debts and what's left is available to feed your family. We are talking about living by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. 
These are the words that shattered the heavy jailhouse doors and snapped the prison bars like matchsticks just to set you free. The words spoken at the time when you were so miserable and you thought you'd better off, you'd be better off dead. And the words, and the words that came to you, it healed you and pulled you back from the brink of death. The words that proceed out of the mouth of God. These are the words that overrode the doctor's testimony about your, uh, your health. The word that gave you more time to arrange your house. These are the words that quiet the big storms of your life. The words that put a muzzle on all the big and turbulent waves that try to toss your life up and down and quiet them into a whisper. The proceeding words out of the mouth of God. These are the words that bring you great joy and gladness as the tempests of your life die down and you are safely brought to harbor. I pray, beloved, that you are reminded that you do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You don't have anything to prove to anybody, but you have to just know what you should do. Real quick, I'll just try to give us five practical ways to make this principle a part of our lives. We need to check ourselves. We need to check our desires by what this word says so that we shall not transition into loss and open the way for the devil to have a hold over us. So what must I do? Beloved, the first principle that we have to, or the first action or activity that we want to engage or tactic that we must engage so that we stay by this principle of living by the preceding word is that you want to read and study your Bible. You must read and study your Bible. The best gift that you can give anyone who does not have a Bible is to get one for them. And we must be reminded, let me say it, although it may sound redundant, your Bible includes the Old Testament. You must know what the law and the prophets say. You must know what the gospels say. Every written word deserves your attention. So read and study your Bible. I want to encourage us to look for a 15-minute window to go on a date with God on a daily basis. It could be during your lunch break. You just take 15 minutes to take your Bible. You walk to a, a quiet corner and just invite the Lord and as you sit down, you thank God for honoring that date. And you read for 15 minutes. At the end of that time, you just tell the Lord that well, I need to get back to work. I look forward to our next date. That exercise, beloved, is going to change your life. The third thing I want you to consider is you purpose in your mind to obey God no matter what. Let your obedience resonate with God such that he will say of you that he or she will do whatever I tell him or her to do. That comes from your obedience to God. Beloved, make God, the fourth thing is you make God priority in your life. And to demonstrate that would be to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let it come as a constant reminder to you that you must love your neighbor, even that difficult neighbor, the neighbor who put all sorts of signs that you are averse to on their yard, the neighbor who, who will not you know, mow their lawn, the neighbor who plays loud music. You have to purpose in your mind that I have to love my neighbor as a demonstration that God is priority in my life. I'm loving my neighbor in obedience to the commands of the Lord, that I should love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, and that I should love my neighbor as I love myself. 
So you are doing it in obedience. And by so doing, you want to place God as number one in your life. The, the fifth and the last is live by the commands you find in the Bible. Become a living epistle. Walking and talking Bible. Let that be your portion. So your life be shaped by living, you know, the proceeding word out of the mouth of God. And may it help you to ensure that your desires shall never become lost. May the Lord bless the preaching of his holy word today. Amen. 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 Love, we're a bit over uh, 1 p.m. closing time by four minutes. Can we get a few quick comments and we can wrap up here? Okay, in the absence of that, we just go ahead and pray. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for having received your word. We pray, O oh, glorious God, that we shall walk in practice of what we have heard today. May we study your word, Lord. May we make these appointments to go on dates with you. May we make you priority in our lives. May we walk, Father. May our lifestyle be shaped by your words. Lord, we pray. And may we live according to what we have studied from your word. We pray, Father, that may our focus in life be about what we should do based on what we have learned from your word that you have commanded us to do. May our focus in life be to discover who you are and the potential that you have deposited in us. May our focus in life, Father, be to study and discover our identity in Christ. May we, O oh God, come to that place of understanding that we can do all things through Christ who gives us the strength. May we come to that place of understanding that you released us into this world with a special uniqueness of your character, of your nature that you want to show the world through us. That is why no two people look exactly the same. That is why no two people act exactly the same, but that we have come to bring a portion of you to mankind. And Father, may our desire be to demonstrate that in us. We pray, Lord, that we'll be able to hear your Holy Spirit as he speaks to us wherever we go and in whatever we do, so that we'll manifest, oh God, your divine purposes through our lives. Father, we just surrender to living by the proceeding words out of your mouth. Father, we say and we ask for the grace to never fall to that place where we want to do anything to prove that we can do it because you have given us the ability to do all things. Daddy, we thank you for this time. We pray that their word, which is the truth, will go forth and bring deliverance in the life of your sons and daughters so that none who has come to this gathering will live the same. For your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Beloved, can we share final greetings? Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Lord Christ. Jesus Christ. The, the love of God. God. The fellowship the of, the of the Holy Spirit. Be with be us now and forever. forever. And surely, surely God, the goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. Of our lives. And we shall ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.